Welcome to the Two Month Review, the weekly podcast brought to you by Open Letter and 3%, in which we take one book, or in this case, five, and break them down bit by bit, section by section, talk about them, analyze, joke, have fun, discuss, so on and so forth. I am Chad Post from Open Letter Books, joined as always by Brian Wood, author of Joy Time Killbox. Uh, good to be here. Just came from my barista job. Um, I was doing unicycle lessons with some other hipsters, and uh, this, is the outfit, this is the outfit they make you wear for Unicycle League. That I'm a part of. <laughs> there, it's it's strange that there is like a weird unicycle faction here in Rochester. <laughs> is, that, like, real. is there? Is it, yeah, there is. There used to be on campus. There's like a club. And uh, Kai, were you? Did you see it happen? Also joined by Kaya, by the way. <laughs> Kaya oh, bring out our other co-host, <laughs> Kaya Stravinus. Uh Hello. editor of Letter Books, uh, translator from Latvian, so on and so forth. So on and so forth. So filler, on, so forth. filler in of no one else showed up this week. Boom. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, no, Kaya did see a unicyclist trying to go through one of the doorways here in the hall, and it just disturbed. <laughs> it was like, what the fuck? I had a student that took a header on one of those uh, electric one wheel thingamajigs oh. and was like out for, like, yeah, I broke my collarbone and scraped my face up. Well, that's, yeah, that's what you get for riding an electronic unicycle. Yeah, you're an adult. <laughs> Have some respect for yourself. I, I can't understand the physics between but, but behind any of that. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Anyway, so we are we can banter some more, but just for anyone listening, we are this this season talking about Anne Quinn's Uva, and we're at three, um, her second novel that was published. And we are talking about the whole thing today and finishing it off. So this is the story that we began last week, just to recap um, where we were, that Ass has died, um, apparently of a suicide. She's a, a, a woman, um, young woman, who was involved with a couple of like sort of middle-aged, uh, well, I don't know, not middle-aged. I mean, the guy's about to turn 40, I think. So like, I mean, very, he, she's very young. They are young, um, young couple uh, that is kind of middle-class bougie. And she was involved with them, maybe sexually and in other ways, uh, doing mimes and whatnot. And they are sort of going through their life, trying to figure out, in a way, uh, why she killed herself, looking through her journals, her diaries, her uh, videos, her recordings, and sort of dealing with their own, I don't know, life and, and sexual relationships. So that's pretty much right. That's, yeah, you're in the ballpark. Everything ends with a question mark inflection. All those statements. I mean, it's it's it's, it's tough because it is in, intentionally ambiguous in like a number of points throughout the book, and the ending is doubly intentionally so, which I know is something that you want to talk about, Kaya. But I don't know if we want to start there. Or if we want to start with like just general impressions. So since you're the the new guest the this week and haven't had a chance to talk about it, what was your experience reading your first Anne Quinn book, and specifically, what did you think of three? Um, I liked it very much. Um, I was reminded, I listened to you guys talk about it last week and was reminded of, um, some of the Marguerite Duras books that I've read. Um, I know Brian, you mentioned like the short sort of cinema, cinemagraphic, um, sentences and the sort of images and the beachside stuff. Um, I thought it was really funny at the beginning. There were the, um, I think, R is just such a, such a Karen in the most, like, I love, I love how the cat, I love how the cat is this, the cat is this device for like, I don't know. I don't know what it is about the, it's just, it's a device. She'll like, it's this weird buffer. And I love how everything, everything that has to do with the cat, like the part where it's throwing up on his bed and she's just like, like it, He's like, I hate this thing. I hate it so much. And she loves it so much. Um, but it's this, uh, yeah, it's it's this weird device that she ends up using. Anyway, um, I thought it was, I thought it was really great. I liked it. I thought it was very funny at points. I thought it got really, really dark um, in the second part. And some of the things are really hard to swallow. And I think it speaks to a lot of um just sort of a lot of paranoias and neuroses that I think anyone has in terms of relationships of like um, even S talking about it and like uh, in, in her diary. Um, and yeah, it was, 
I'm just, I'm the second part sort of screwed me up um, mentally in the head, uh, but it was, it was fantastic. It was really, really great. Um, can I say my hot takes now or, or should I, what should I do? Just <laughs> give Brian a chance. What did you think, Brian? Uh, yeah, I liked, I liked the, uh, I liked the second half as well. Um, I think it was interesting. Um, you get kind of spaced almost equally, uh, these like graphic sex scenes in the first half and the second half. And they kind of come right around, oh, bad choice of words. <laughs> they, um, they, they take place around the, like about the same kind of page length. Um, into the each half of the book, which I thought was very interesting. And they're very different uh, sex scenes. Where's, so the, was, where's, where's the first one at? Well, we'll, we'll I don't know. You were the one that had to read it out to everybody. Jeez. I know. I mean, I'll find it again. I, I like. <laughs> I've got a new one this week. I've got some new ones this week, though. So, but yeah. Yeah, not, I'm trying to find what page it's on right now. Well, I like that one. aspect of it. And then I, I thought the um, how pathetic L was, or, or uh, Leon was in the second half, was so like wonderfully hilarious uh i really liked uh hitting him with the ugly stick like every possible chance i thought i just thought it was great <laughs> i think that they're i mean it's almost vaude, not vaudeville but like it's very funny when it's like the sections that are the the three voices actually it's like her him yeah. and then a narrator uh that's objective sort of going back and forth it starts to get such an interesting rhythm of like how they're talking and they're all a little bit like funny and weird and like I don't know. I really liked. It. I wrote on the beginning of this section is page. We're doing seventy six onwards, and the on page seventy nine, I just wrote at the top. This book is so funny. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know why. There's nothing else underlined. That's just like standing by itself at the top of the page. And weird. So, where you want to start with your your hot take, Kaya? You got a I hot mean, take. So yeah, just to wrap. To, to wrap up like what the, the book is then, there's not that much more. There's not like more of a plot. They uh, go back to the city. They sometimes come, want to go back to the country. We find out that there was like one time that several occasions, um, locals were tormenting uh, Leon in particular, uh, <laughs> including possibly pretending to be statues and then kind <laughs> 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 of Yeah, what was that? Breaking what the breaking the windows to the to the greenhouse, like but just like it's tormenting. Terrifying. It was terrifying. <laughs> that last the last entry, the like the last parts of the book, that full on journal entry from S, where it like explains so much of what they listen to, those little fragments in the recording. What do, do you guys have any guesses as to what the hell was going on with that? They're like chucking shards of metal at him. Yeah. I, I I just envisioned it was like uh, shitty British kids who are like hooligans. That I mean, like he's like this weirdo like art troupe person like in their yeah. town. Like get out of here, you, like freaking weirdo! Like yeah, you're a creep. Everybody thinks you're a creep. Like you're you comb the beach, staring at people and like, videotaping them. <laughs> yeah, like you freaking creep. Like everybody knows he's a creep. With ca carrying around your uh, pipe chewing on it every so often <laughs> like a lot a lot of the times that they describe him sitting against like a wall with this pipe being all like whatever it's like yeah. that, guy's, that guy's gonna get beat up uh yeah he's like a typical guy in publishing yeah just this, gro this gross lascivious creep <laughs> just, trying to, just trying to get that get that pipe in his mouth oh my god um I have multiple. I have multiple hot takes. I okay. really do. One of the things I, I want to talk about are the orchids, though. Oh, orchids first. Okay. I am surprised you guys did not talk about the orchids for the first part of the book, to be totally honest. Um, We're traumatized from uh, Nabokov, I think. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's possible. Um, but so, so many orchids and so many, so many things things about it and um I actually went up and looked up the meaning and symbolism of orchids because beside the whole like you know the Georgia O'Keeffe of it all of like the the female body part and the sensuality and all of those things um so the symbolism associated with the orchid is love beauty refinement many children thoughtfulness and mature charm none of which Leon has or Ruth none of which either of them have. And so I thought that was, I mean, I thought the meaning part was fascinating because 
it's like they're the exact opposite of all of it. Initially, I was thinking, um, you know, oh, it's obvious because it's the he's being all gentle and tender with the the orchid because it's like the female, it's like the vagina and mm -hmm. and all that sensuality and like being very careful with it and showing s and tending to them and getting really upset about it. Um, but and like even leaving even leaving the magazines open like it's pornography that someone's discovering yeah. like that big full page spread of the orchids um but now at the end of it i think it's just really sad like it's really sad and that goes into one of my hot takes is that i don't think i don't think s had any sort of relationship sexual relationship with either of them i think that she embodied a lot of those things that they then tried to parrot. Ruth and Leon tried to parrot, like Ruth writing the diary, Leon doing the recording. Um, I'm hoping that the person S was writing about was not her own father um, with the sexually explicit stuff. Um, I think that's definitely Leon. I don't think I'll that you, it I'll is. My textual but, take on that. In a that's second. fine. That's fine. <laughs> but I think. I don't think that I I think Leon is like a like a premature ejaculator. Like I don't think I don't think these people Ruth and Leon are good at sex. Like that's the vibe no. that I got. Like I don't cuz even Leon was like I don't <sighs> I don't know that they have to be good at sex. I, I, I mean you just call them a dude. He's like a <laughs> dude um here's one thing though this is the quote that i've been sitting on for a while here for for days that i haven't shared okay so this is from Anne quinn a quote from Anne quinn herself i did fantasize a lot about being in bed with a man and a woman and i introduced a boyfriend of mine to a girlfriend of mine and they both knew it was one of my fantasies so we explored it together it was important to my writing that it extended the fantasy this actual experience was so far beyond the fantasy that i found it very well you could say enlarging in America, I went into it very easily. And again, it was beautiful, very much like a dance. You don't know whose hand it is or whose mouth. And this is extraordinarily exciting. But that's, that's her. That's Anne Quinn. That's not yeah, related that's to Anne your Quinn. statement. That's the Anne Quinn thing. So I, I do have more that can build off of that. I mean, I can get to the statement why I think, why I think they did in a second. But um. But I think that this this book is intensely personal, I think, for her, too. She mm -hmm. was supposedly involved with a, or I forget, it's in uh, it's in a ebook. I don't have it in front of me. But um, she was involved with a couple for a while. And there is assumptions that this is about Alan Burns and his wife, Carol, mm -hmm. um, who she spent a lot of time with in America in a similar sort of situation in which it was like, to sort of upset the the mores of the time and to like do something that's like a little transgressive or to treat like in in uh other ways like that it's not it's it's that that there's other ways of like of pairing off people and having like this this she's like way into throupling but um the the textual thing so she so that all this about her dad in here is like very mirrors her her life um there is something that I'm jumping all over the place, but there's that new bio on Kathy Acker that comes out tomorrow um, that it has like quotes about how she was like, well, I'm not one Kathy Acker, I'm many, which also seems to re be reflected in Anne Quinn's life and in, in this book. Um, and there is a one, one thing that I read that had like used a lot of the symbolism of it in that each one of the characters is trying to become something. They can only become something if they're like facing or dealing with the mountain where she goes and kills herself in the lake, that the sea is very reflective of like a certain sensuality, but also of a self that the masks that they constantly wear and talk about the masks a lot um, like that. Uh, and she even says like, well, I don't know if Ruth's wearing masks with me or with Leon, um, but they talk about masking and trying to find their identity through those plays in which it's like all kind of, two people leave one, one leaves two, they all leave each other, they all get together, together. Um, but that those those elements, the sea also where the sea uh, is, has a, a break wall. So like everything that's on the other side of that is like human life, like it's detritus. Like they talk about all the gross trash that's over there, but like on this side, it's like sterile. Um, and their relationship is sort of sterile. So my reasoning why I think that they did 
is that when she talks about the one that my, my favorite one, my favorite sex line here this week, Chad's favorite sex section, um, was it like this with never before, not like this, no one has touched me ever, never, never like this before, like waves, the coming slowly, dual roles realized, yes, 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 be a boy if you like anything, just be. But then earlier, Ruth is like, well, she must have had sex with someone who like talked dirty to her. And that's referenced then when Leon is like raping uh, Ruth, there's like more towards that end of like the dirty talk side of things, which I think Ruth has seen through ass who has done it with Leon. So I believe that is the, that is a circle that I think that they have that I, I'm, I would be hard. It would be hard pressed to convince me that, that Leon and S never bone. I, I would have agreed at the beginning, but for me, by the end of the book, because there is like, like there, there's so many moments where Leon is trying to be some, like a different version of, of himself through what S has said about men and Ruth trying to be a different version of herself. Like, like I said, she starts writing a journal and he starts recording um, but he doesn't say those things to Ruth and that, that he doesn't, <laughs> when, when he rapes her, um, until after they both hear that recording. So like, it's like, he's been fed lines and Ruth says something before that happens too. I don't remember where it is or what page it's on, but she says something about like, um, like, I wonder what it must be like to, like, there's some something like that where she's like, I wonder, like, imagining what it must be like to, to be S or to have those sorts of feelings or emotions or interactions. And that's why I think that Leon being just bad at reading the room and bad at intimacy does that because he's like, well, like, part of him thinks that that's what she must want because they've been reading S's diaries and listening to these recordings. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, would, I would have agreed with you in the first half of the book, but at the second half, I, like, I think they both, I think both Leon and Ruth would want it to have been Leon, but I don't think it was. I don't know, Brian. Well, I, I got the feeling that uh, in that, the triangle between the three of them, um, Leon and Ruth do a lot of projecting onto S as to like who, who they want to be, what fantasies they want to have. Um, like they use her, I feel like to, to live those out. Um, I, and it didn't really dawn on me until L or Leon was out of the picture for a little bit and Ruth changes and uh, S notices it quite a bit and was kind of happy to have Leon be gone for a little bit or just be the two of them and kind of explore what that's going to be like. Um, but then I, I, I did find it interesting, too, that um, Ruth has a lot of uh, distrust and jealousy over whatever S and, um, and Leon had. And you see that in um, on page 88, um, when he goes, he sat on the edge of the bed, gazed into his coffee cup. Leon, do you have fantasies when, well, when we make love ever? I mean, do you love? Just wonder, not obscene things, darling. Just, or not, darling, not awful, dirty things like, like, depends on how you think of these matters. What sort of fantasies, Leon? Oh, I don't know. It depends. Depends on what? Mood, I suppose. Like, it goes on and, like, there's this, uh, that's, that's when they're coming back drunk from the, uh, from the dinner, which ties in perfectly with White Lotus if you're watching White Lotus. I know. <laughs> White Lotus, and there's this show on Amazon called Mammals that sort of bounces off of this as well. Uh, but I, yeah, exactly. Um, so it leads me to believe that there may, there probably was something with Leon and um, S with the way Ruth um, has so much jealousy towards it. Um, but I like the fact that it can be ambiguous and read either way if you want. And I think it makes it more fun. It, I think that it can be read is that it's ambiguous. There is the, uh, there is one reading of the crosses, which I know that you uh, kind of thought were like him jerking off or having sex with, with Ruth in which it's him having sex with ass. Um, and that's what Ruth believes it is. Anyways, there's also like an implication, although not that's never followed up, but when she goes to like, so the dad has the real statues, the dad made the, the big statues that are in the, the 
empty pool um, where they play their mind games. And his statues are all like broken and small and corrupted. And then when uh, Ruth finds them, they're like shattered. I thought it's possible that they just fucked on those statues. Very cinematic. Wow. There you go. Yep. <laughs> either either those statues are made out of very, very poor materials or they fucking hard. <laughs> and like either like or this. There's I have a symbolism different. too with the seaside caves that, you know, and uh going to the the shore and all of that. I have a different really hot take that I'm stealing from someone else that uh, that that we can dissect that is really interesting and goes beyond what you what you thought, Kaya. So you're you stated that you don't know that she committed suicide. I'm somewhere between I I'm somewhere between thinking she did not commit suicide, <laughs> like she intended to leave. There's a part there's a part somewhere where she says she writes about how it's kind of the perfect location and setting to just like take a boat. The water does things and you could disappear without a trace and no one would really know what happened. Um, I mean, I think it's fully possible that she did die, but if she did, I'm not convinced that she died with intent. Like, I think it's possible that she's like, I'm just going to disappear and then see what happens. Like maybe she will, maybe she won't. Um, but I'm, I could go either way, but I think that I, I focused on that very much that she's describing the sort of um, intentional getting lost and not leaving a trace. The one that threw me off was the, the body that comes out of the lake with the stab wounds. Okay, with so here we go. Fishing knife. I, I think Leon murdered her. We, the, the thing that is found, the thing that we're told at the very start is that her jacket is found, the boat the boat and her jacket, but not a body, just a jacket with a note in it that's a suicide note. All this sort of also sort of mirrors the end, the end Quinn's life. There's then a reference to like where he's like, I don't think that she, one of the two of them is like, I don't think that she killed herself because she never talked about it. Um, and, and then uh, one of the other ones says something like, well, you know, you might plan on it for 40 years and then one day just kill yourself and like it could happen either way and then um so there's several references in her journals to when she rides takes the boat out in the morning that someone's watching her and that that she feels a third presence watching her like on 1 uh 39 um several evenings now i've taken the boat out rode towards the mountains such an overall quietness that i feel an intruder and often just let the boat drift with the tide a lot and then the last thing that Leon says is that he finds the body, like you said, Brian, the unclothed body of an unidentified young woman with stab wounds in back and abdomen was found yesterday by a lake near the Sugarloaf Mountain. A bloodstained angler's knife and hammer were also found, which could be then that she was murdered, her body was disposed of, set up as a suicide, and that's and that Leon Leon killed her. I'll add that level of ambiguity and, and wildness to it. Were there also well, uh, Sorry, I was gonna say there's also that group of guys who are like playing around with knives on the breakwater. Throw it into, yeah, that's true. Like you do. I do. Could be, but she might not have. She might not have committed suicide at all. Like, but had something much more tragic happen. Well, aside from being a rapist, um, he also has other character flaws that we see throughout. I mean, like. There was something really creepy, and I don't want to say it's a character flaw, but there's something very creepy and weird with him, like collecting the mollusks and prying them open. Like it makes, it's almost like rape imagery with that, where he's prying things open and there's nothing inside. Right? Yeah, exactly. it's, it's a hollow. And then there's like the, like his 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 like fetishization with having a crab and like the and like the other dead animals um, throughout it. And then it makes you think with like smashed. Um, smashed uh sculptures right like there's like hammer imagery that you have to have with that as well yeah so you have like this knife and you have this hammer and then you have the you know it means a it's all for ussr i think it's a giant uh, hammer and sickle it's <laughs> clearly <laughs> the pro i mean he then, is he is interned in, interned during the war so like and then my my favorite one though is he gets the shit beat out of him but he's totally fine but he insists on wearing bandages and going around like playing a victim right like this like huge victim and he's kind of lurking around people see him looking at other people in the balconies and they scream or whatever people know he's a creep and people know he's he's, he's strange he's no good like it's it's known 
there's this, um, I don't remember if it was on Spotify, but there was a, a podcast series about this unsolved murder mystery that took place in Cork in Ireland. And there was the main guy that's been accused of, uh, and that everyone believes murdered this woman, is this guy who's like a tall artist, wears some weird shit, is creepy. And they're like, most of the evidence is that he's just kind of creepy and is always around. <laughs> he's like, sort of like the guy that you'd be like, yeah, that guy is someone who would probably murder someone for sure. And that's who I kept picturing with, with Leon, except carrying his pipe really pretentiously all the time. <laughs> Pretentious pipe. So, so yeah, I mean, if I was investigating a murder, like, yeah, you would definitely be a suspect. Why not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There, yeah, they, uh, they, I like to, to to build on one of the other things that you're mentioning about the father and all that. So yeah, I'm like 116. She certainly had, she certainly had what? What did she want of us, Leon? What was she after? I really don't understand. Unless, yes, she was a little in love with you in a strange way. And who, who in love? I think Ruth plus a father complex. Um, <clears throat> which there is like a lot of stuff in this book where it does seem like S is trying to define herself in relationship to them and reinvigorate them. Like uh, there's a reference that's in this scholarly book to the Francis Booth one that uh, she repairs dolls and that that in a way that like she could be repairing Leon in his broken ass statues. Um, but that, and that uh, like you were saying, Brian, I think both of you that they both like project onto her and reflect off of her. And like everyone's trying to find their sort of identity through this. <clears throat> and I think that in some ways, like for us, it's it's a very sexualized one. And that's why I think that her and Leon have a relationship because a lot of her journals involve like the this kind of the father adoration, but also like the abortion part, the stuff about the Jesus, um, like the things that like the description of the coming, like it's a lot, it's a lot more there at a time too that in the 60s was like the kind of thing. And that these guys, these people are a little older and outside of that, that uh, sexual awakening period. And instead, she's like kind of bringing them back to life. And what did she want out of them? Is it like a real question in the book? Also, I think the book's really interesting because it does set up a murder mystery or a mystery that's not unsolved again, like more so than Berg, where Berg seems like it's a mystery, but isn't really. This one kind of is set up as a mystery, but isn't a mystery either because there's no resolution or really... You don't know if there's even a like a crime. I can raise my hand like it's a Zoom meeting um, in between uh, <laughs> Alex throwing pillows and screaming that he wants juice. Um, so you brought up the the fact of uh, S repairing dolls and repairing things. There's on page 120, the very long paragraph where Ruth is listening to Leon's recording. And it almost sounds like it almost sounds like he experienced some sort of massive trauma while he was in prison, like maybe was raped himself. Um, like that he's, that he's broken and maybe, I don't know, like that whole long thing where it's like, I've been in a trance, no doubt. Um, but who can say there's any def something like confronted by an existence I know I can no longer believe in. But who can say there's any definition in what has been? Three aspects, yes, yes, that can be recognized. Now, the boy, youth, man, each contradicting. Um, and then it goes off and it talks about the war. And then it's like the little soldier playing with real lives to create a bigger and better world where all things, everybody would be equal. You believed in that. He did at least. The belief then was something concrete. And it's like, like ten soldiers screaming, shuddering, like all this weird stuff. So, like, what if? An, I mean, it kind of feels like there is that one aspect where S may have seen something, you know, like deeply broken in um, Leon, and maybe that's why the the sort of closeness between them and that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I four, I'm trying to mute myself in between four-year-old munchies rage over here. Um, but yeah, there's like there are these moments where Leon seems like less of a less of a dope and really like he's got some really intense stuff going on. Um Yeah, like on the next page, <clears throat> even in that cell, solitary confinement, when time became meaningless, 
Even there, I had the part to play out. The boy who saw himself the man with a cause, not necessarily disillusion. Oh, no, it never came to that. There is Her writing is so fun in the way that it does, like, it can be very, like, telegraphic at times, but also, like, uh, it transitions in the middle without, with missing, like, commas or things that you would usually use as, like, cues to switch voice or to, like, split the sentence. Um, I think that's always, it's kind of fun. I've got one more for doing this knives out murder murder investigation. Yeah, murder investigation. Let's do it. On page on page one thirty seven. So it says, apart from a few bruises and a black eye, L had not been badly hurt. He insisted on wearing bandages around his head. He went to the police station later in the evening, handed over the glove, and made a lengthy statement. He returned, convinced they were mad there too. He felt they hadn't really believed him. Kept giving each other knowing looks, winks, as if. I'd go to all this trouble of making things up, he said, while sticking parts of sculpture together. You've got the cockerel's head back to front, R pointed out. Its bronzed eyes now stare from the terrace at the house. Like so that? Like the, yeah, he's, a, he's, a, he's got another story for us. You're like, wink, wink, whatever. Get out of here. But the thing that I find interesting is the idea of the putting the sculpture backwards and now, instead of looking from the house out to the terrace, it's looking at the terrace back to the house. Like that's why some of these things where the like the local kids coming at him, it almost seemed it seemed like a like hate crime. Like you know, like he, if he's homosexual or bisexual, and they're or worse, socialist. Or yeah, or worse, socialist. I mean, there was that whole thing about like the traitor being a traitor <laughs> and all that stuff, but. Um, yeah, like it's like once you read that last entry from S and you get all these extra details, it's like I, it's so kind of heart wrenching. It's, it's awful. <laughs> People are awful. Which part are you, when you say the last entry from her, is there a specific part there? Um, I think I'm talking like the last. Um, it's like the last part of the book. Yeah, where... the, last, the last section is her law is like stuff from like Midsummer's Eve. Yes, yeah, like that part where you start to it starts to fit together some of the pieces of the things that um, we've heard those little like uh, snippets um, of the audio recordings that they listen to, and this kind of fills in a lot of those blanks and gives a totally different perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was seeing if there was like a specific paragraph or, or section. But um no. I mean it is they are at Sugarloaf, where that body is found. That is undeniable. She referenced it on the last page. And behind me the morning I this morning I got up early and went for a walk, crossed over the breakwater and several others. Behind one, a party of cripples lay. A few men without arms were in the water. Some sat in pools. Behind them, rising out of the mist, I could just see the peak of the sugar loaf as though floating on its own. Um, again, well, there's another, there's a lot of dismemberment. And like the things that are, are half broken or cracked or are dissolved. And there's another, not to say that, I mean, you know, no disrespect towards the otherly able, but the way that it's written there of like those without arms sitting in pools is kind of a weird uh, way of describing that. Yeah, all this broken stuff. Like I made a note. Um, yep. Um, <laughs> Andy has to go pee. Um, so I had a note from page 142. Um, and she's so... Mm -hmm. So she, okay, so halfway down page 142, where S is talking about, like, Elle got back earlier than expected, um, and then she talks about the night they spent in the hotel, which could be, couldn't be, but the smell of our bodies, drink tobacco, pretending to sleep, um, but then she goes, it says, but the sense of touch fantasies re-explored, or was it, like... 
Get oh no, at, and at and that night under a single sheet, I remember other nights spent in the hotel, the curtains drawn, and I that's where I didn't. Um, where I don't, um, where I don't, I'm not sure if she's talking about, like the note I basically have is that there are so many parts like that where it's like very subtle shift in the sentence where it's like remembering another time, re remembering other fantasies where the, it leads me to believe like S came out of some sort of very intense and raw relationship at her young age into this kind of living situation with, Ruth and and Leonard um and that she's seen and felt things that they could only imagine um and BB3 uh, now and incest yeah mm -hmm. whip me with your hair let me come between your breasts and your mouth ear hollow your back hair on his chest burnt with a cigarette so there's there is some there, there's a way to do that. That I also think that there's references to like going in and out of the hotel, knowing that it's not that she's not his wife. There also is like a sly reference somewhere. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to find it to like when Ruth references him going away to his various conferences. That maybe this is like more serial uh, uh, fair having than it is simply with us. And that that all those crosses. She's like, you weren't even here. You were at a conference. Like that also seems like a possible read on the whole thing too. <laughs> Anyways, this is really naughty. I did think I like I like I like Ruth gets a little more Ruth gets a lot more sympathetic in the second half, but she's still a pretty ridiculous like kind of uh, figure at most for most of the book. Like, she's such a two-faced such a karen she's like oh go out and get some meat for my dear little bobo and then watches out the curtains and the second he's gone she's like pouring out the whiskey putting on the dresses masturbating with s's clothes on yep 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 um yeah that's she's that's living her best she's, she's living her best life any more sexy <laughs> listening to goodbye horses by the cure <laughs> what I do whenever I get a single moment alone, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's a Silence of the Lambs reference to our younger viewers. I don't know if you've seen that movie or not. Uh, <laughs> no, they've only seen Hannibal, the TV show. All three yeah. seasons. <laughs> oh man. I don't know. I don't know what else to, to say with this. I thought there's like some interesting, the, the Francis Booth book is pretty interesting in terms of talking about like different reads on it and like the, the sort of symbolism. Um, and then I like like the kind of the the style of it and the form that's being used here. And like what you said, Brian, of like the sign of symmetry between those where the things are placed and like how it involves these three components over and over again and really is like obsessed with that to the point where it is on the sentence or in the paragraph level that it is switching, switching, switching. And then there'll be the a new paragraph that's just Leon in a paragraph that's just Ruth, and then back to like the two of them with this third voice inner inner join. It's it feels so much more controlled than I think the first time I read it, where it felt like it was just like you know someone doing some crazy, weird writing shit. Like it feels a lot more plotted or like uh, or intentional than it did uh, twenty years ago. Yeah, I mean, like sort of like a dramatis persona. It's it's very. Uh... I don't know, it's extremely dramatic and like a play when you're mm -hmm. it with the the three central characters. The the voices sound really crisp at times. I mean, in some ways, it's almost like the beginning of his like stage direction, right? It's in yeah. it's in italics. A man fell to his death from a sixth floor window of Prescott House off the off Market Square today. He was a messenger employed by a soap manufacturing firm. Ruth settled from the newspaper, like you know, we get stage it's or stage Ruth, left, yeah. I have two of those right there. Ruth startled from the newspaper by Leonard framed in the doorway, which is another way that you could envision like the play mm -hmm. of, it, of her, like looking up and him standing in a fake doorway on like a stage, which ties in their whole miming thing too. And all their like masks and uh, whatnot. Interesting. Yeah. I just looked up uh, Orchids in the UK because I was thinking maybe there was something um in keeping them in a greenhouse but there are 
52 different species of wild orchid that grow in Britain. So like these are not necessarily flowers that need to be coddled and kept in this greenhouse that well that that's where I think too that a lot of this I I you know I think it was with this one that we talked about the pinch and entropy story, right? Mm. Or was it or was it that with Berg? But it's a similar sort of thing in which like he's got this this the greenhouse keeping things in there. Their relationship is kept within these bounds. Everything is like sort of structured that way. And then when something breaks in, either the kids breaking the windows, throwing things at them, or us entering in, that disrupts that sort of slow dying entropy that they're suffering from. It's like you can't see, like without us, like their relationship is so banal and so fucking dumb and boring, and would just like peter out in every way. It seems like to me, like they seem like uninterested and uninteresting. And like she becomes their one source of conversation. Sort of way, like, so one of those uh, quotes I remember, but I don't remember anything else from the movie of like four weddings and a funeral, but I feel like there's some line in there where someone says, oh, well, the reason that you have babies is because you don't have anything else to talk about. And they don't have babies. And they and, don't uh, have babies. So they end up having. But here, here's a more fun botany one if you want to go down a botany uh, rabbit hole was the man, there's a mention of a mandrix sprouting. You don't have a mandrix sprouting between your legs, right? Yeah, that's also why I think that they didn't have, it's possible they didn't have like an, a sexually intimate relationship because he's all like, she's like, well, did you get an erection? He's like, well, no. Like, like that's there's something very... Um, there's another part with that that ties into that where he's trying to, or he's acting like he's hanging himself. Yeah. Yeah. Goes, oh yeah, Ruth, like this is how some people get a boner or whatever. He doesn't say boner or actually. Yeah. I I can't find it right now, but I really I really like it when they like the the townies for lack of better word come and just wreck the garden <laughs> and Ruth is like clutching the curtains and Leon is out in the like cons like the greenhouse like screaming against the window and S is just like this is awesome. <laughs> this is these people needed something to shake things up. Yeah, yeah. this is my throuple. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> so I wrote a, I wrote a story last month that had a mandrake in it. So I had to look up stuff on mandrakes. And the one fun fun fact about mandrakes is they used to believe that it was like a small person in the root of it, and it screams when you pull it up. And if you hear it scream, you'll die. Yeah. So you have to tie a dog to it, oh. and then you tie. Uh, then you have another end of the leash and you tug the dog so that it pulls up the root of the mandrake and that the way the dog dies instead of you. Yeah. <laughs> there, I feel <laughs> so. Duh. Completely <laughs> there. Yeah. That's that's how I do my mandrakes. <laughs> hey, can I borrow your dog? Why? <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> my other one died. <laughs> there must be a horror movie called Mandrake. Running out of dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's like the that's the uh, um, the the B side Harry Potter. Uh, yeah. That's the only place I know mandrakes from. Oh, Harry really? Potter is yeah. a placenta yeah. buried under the mandrake. You're supposed to bury a placenta under it. So, yeah, yum. <laughs> I don't know. Anything else you guys want to touch upon that we didn't? Or questions? I love the cat. I love how much. He hates the cat. That's when he's trying to like, yeah, he's trying to fuck that cat up. And there's even the one line where like, my line of the week, we could just jump to that. It's like, I get it. It has worms. You don't have to tell me three times. Yeah, the cat. I get it. it's called three, but you don't have to tell me three times the cat has worms. I'll remember it the first time. <laughs> my favorite line of the week is just fuck the bloody cat. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it's, I don't know. I don't know. It's got a, yeah. I would. I think if I reread this, I could get more of those theories and more of those that kind of playing with the amb ambiguity. And it does remind me um, a little bit of the way that like the certain Nicholas Mosley books function as plays, like including like Catastrophe Practice, which is set up as a play. But a lot of the Catastrophe Practice series and some of his other books always reference like play like imagery and like language and ways of like staging things and talking about the idea of a, of a player of a drama and how you act and a certain way to cause certain things to happen. And this sort of re reminds me, it fits in very well with, with his books that um, we'll be reissuing soon. 
Sorry, Alex I like, I tried like to. Page, uh, my line is on uh, page 89 um, when he's trying to suck on her breasts and she's not really having it. Uh, what are you thinking now, Leon? <laughs> Nothing, love. Just feeling. And you. That you look like a baby doing this? That all I am? And, mm, ooh, ah. He gurgled, sucked, clutched harder. <laughs> well, I love their, their relationship. It's, so. it's like you read a Cosmo article on how to make your woman hot. And he's like. I like her next line, though, too. Ah, oh, don't, darling. You're hurting. You're bruising me. You know how tender I am. Well, that's a really bad foreshadow, too, right? Ah, I mean, uh, yeah. Bad. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's funny, but then it's super dark. A man who's so good at the horticulture is pretty bad at uh, <laughs> the horticulture. Oh, no, boom. you're welcome. Boom. Um, my my favorite liner section 105 at the bottom is when Leon gets his shipment of orchids from abroad, and. Uh, so she, I guess Ruth, goes back to the piano, hands folded, only for a moment in that silence, while he, being Leon, carefully unpacked orchids from abroad, marked books to evade the customs health authorities, <laughs> because nobody cares about I mean, he's, a tr he's a translator. We all know that translators are creeps. It's just like a given. You're mm -hmm. like a translator artist hanging out in the country with your orchids and your pipe. Jonathan, definitely. <laughs> was that, <laughs> that so that person is definitely a Jonathan <laughs> yep yep um yeah you guys you guys uh I'll show you guys my... beware beware of Jonathan's I'll show you guys my statue collection sometime Okay, well, we'll wrap up here. We are uh, next week going to go on to next week being uh, two days from now, if you're watching this live and are listening to it. Um, when the podcast version comes out, we're going to do the first half of Passages, which is the next book that she published. Uh, very poetic, searching for a brother, 108 pages total. So we're doing like the first 54 or five, some yeah, first 56 um, for the first episode. Um, very stylistically strange in terms of like having text down in multiple columns. Um, so a lot more poetic things to deal with. And until then, you can always rate and review us on iTunes or podcast or wherever you get your stuff, Stitcher, I don't know, Spotify. You can join our Patreon. You can like us. You can recommend us. You can retweet us. That would be nice. Retweet us. Retweets. Um, other than that, I don't know. I'm Chad. It's, it's over. We're gonna go now. <laughs>